So now, uh, Laurie Clark McKenna is going to talk about monitoring queue based applications. Hey, um, so I don't have to full screen this, so we're going to be able to see my Firefox header. Um, so I'm going to give very F11. Okay. F11. Not didn't work. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to give the worst title talk today. Uh, it's basically worst example of monitoring right. Microphone? Oh, God. Oh, okay. Uh, do I have a clicky thing as well? Yes, yes. <laughs> so this is going well. Okay, so I'll hit space and that should be fine. Oh, okay. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Yay. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, uh, this is based off the work I did at my previous job at Qubit. Uh, I've since left there and work at another company, not affiliated with either company uh, giving this talk. Um, so the basic idea of what I want to tackle is uh, we often, we're the people in the room are probably the monitoring <laughs> enthusiasts at our various employment places. Uh, but there are also a lot of people there who just, they want monitoring because they are decent engineers and they see it as part of the engineering process, but they're not actually, you know, enthused about monitoring or so on and so forth. So part of what, the way I see that a lot is that people uh, deploy Prometheus or you say, hey, I've got Prom on this Kube Plus, so you should monitor your application. And then the person running the application then says, well, cool, I've read the tutorial, like I know it's the client library. What do I actually monitor? Uh, and part of the way I've been thinking about this is we can kind of define application archetypes. Uh, we see on the prom documentation even, it talks about here's how you monitor something request based. Here's how you monitor something that's kind of batch. And one thing we saw a lot in the qubit was queue based applications, thing that, things that read and write to queues. So my aim is to uh, be a kind of maybe a contrast to the rest of the talks. I don't want to be interesting here. I want to explain how you can implement monitoring without thinking, kind of take a methodical approach that allows you to, at the end of the day, have something, maybe not perfect, uh, but something you can build on, and do it without really needing to think too much about what your application is actually doing, beyond the fact that it seems to be doing something with queues. So I'm going to use, that, use an example. Uh, at Qubit, we had this thing called stash deferred. And it uh, tackled the rather complicated use case of, I want to do something, but in a bit. Uh, so uh, you would say, hey, can you send me, I want to send you this message, but here's a timestamp when I want to send it to you. So kind of a big priority queue. And so we implemented this in a standard way. We spun the big wheel of technologies, and the marker landed on Bigtable. So we had an API that wrote stuff into Bigtable. And then we spun the wheel again, and then it landed on Kinesis. So we wrote out records to Kinesis. And so such third was this little thing in the middle, which sat there, and it had a scanner, which would continually read Bigtable queries, uh, sorry, read Bigtable rows, try and find any that were due, had expired and were due to be sent off. It then get pushed down over a Go channel to a publisher, which would then send them off to Kinesis. And then those keys would get sent down to a deleter, which would then get, delete them from Bigtable. And there's a whole load of faff around making sure we didn't scan the same row twice while it was still being processed. And all of that meant that it didn't scale. And this whole thing uh, kind of, I think it still achieved kind of perfection in computing terms in that it ran on one box and did what it was meant to despite the constraints. Anyway, I unfortunately don't work with Cube anymore, so I had to re-implement it. So I scanned, I, I spun the big wheel of technologies again, ended up with MySQL instead of Bigtable this time. And because it's like a cloud native thing, I had to use a Google product still. So we've got PubSub instead of Kinesis. Um, so how can we monitor this? This is red stuff or whatever. Um, it goes for any uh, uh, operation in the entire world. These are kind of things we can monitor about. Them. There are some operations where you can't really define failure potentially. But um, for basically anything in the world, we can define success, failure, and duration. And these three things aren't actually super useful in terms of maybe alerting. You probably don't want to alert on this for every single random application, <coughs> for every single random operation. But it gives visibility. So when it comes to actually implementing Prometheus, alerting is a much harder goal to achieve. Visibility is something you can implement in an hour. You can get basic 
like idea of what is going on in your application. And people really enjoy knowing what's going on in their application. So in terms of pushing Prometheus adoption, getting the basic visibility and skipping alerting at the beginning is a good way of driving adoption and making people happy. So super quickly, what does this look like in PROM metrics? So we got at the top, we've got delayed MySQL message read total. So standard uh, PROM metric format, we've got a namespace of delayed, an operation, MySQL message read, and then a unit, which is total. Uh, there was a bit of uh, debate whether you should use total or count inside the company. We eventually settled on total because count is used in histograms, and that could potentially be confusing. If Count is your convention, stick to your conventions. Conventions are more important than being correct. Again, here we've got two labels. So we've got uh, failure and success, sorry, one label, two values, failure and success to count, count each uh, case individually. Again, there's uh, in the community, it seems suggested that you have a total without a label and then a separate error metric. We had a very strong convention at Qubit of having a result label with a failure and success value. The convention was a lot more important than being correct on that one. And then histograms. So latencies are potentially a little bit interesting when it comes to monitoring any arbitrary application uh, operation in that we don't actually always know how long something will take. If you really want to implement monitoring without thinking at all, you don't actually want to think about how long it might take to say write to Kinesis, especially if you've never used Kinesis before. So uh, what we've done here is we've monitored everything. We've got buckets in the range of 10 milliseconds all the way up to 10 seconds. And by using exponential buckets with a exponent of root 10, we can cover a vast array of durations without a ton of buckets. And because buckets means more metrics, Prometheus scales with the number of metrics, fewer buckets is better. And one of the biggest problems we saw all the time was people creating way, way too many buckets. And this is an easy way to solve that problem. So dump a monograph. Uh, not an interesting query. We've seen this query before, I think, in different places. But running super quickly through it rate the counts to get a rate, and then aggregate them by result. Uh, in this case, we only ran one uh, instance of this application, so the sum there didn't really do much. But if you're doing this without thinking, you, you want to know that rates, you sum them, because that's just what you do for rates. And roughly the same for quantiles. We're going to sum the rates, uh, and then we're going to take the quantiles. We're doing it by LE. Each his bucket in a histogram is a LE label. So we just sum over the buckets and then take the quantiles. Again, with conventions, uh, it's kind of ruined by the lines on the graph, on the screen, but uh, we use 0 0.5, 0 0.9, 0 0.99. It's not meaningful to compare different quantiles from different, sorry, quantiles with different values. Uh, um, but uh, so we settled a qubit and basically every single dashboard would use 0 0.5, 0 0.9, and 0 0.99. I did want C 0 0.8, but that was an odd day. Um, other things. So dashboards have to be read by people. Units. All of the, the, the metrics seen so far have units in the name. All of the uh, diagrams have units on the side. They also have titles. These are things people make available to you in Grafana, and they're like by far more valuable than, I don't know, coloring your graphs. All of these graphs use the complete default color scheme because it doesn't add any value compared to, say, writing a meaningful title for your graph. Anyway, so that's the really basic stuff. Let's go on to something a little bit queue-specific. So in a queue-based system, usually what we have is a long stream of things writing into each other. And very basic, we have uh, component A, which is writing into component B. And it's doing that over some kind of communication. So this back pressure is what happens when the thing we're writing into starts slowing down. So the way, we, way component A writes into component B can happen in three kind of ways. It can happen that it's unbuffered between them. So in something like PubSub, you can have an arbitrary number of uh, messages that are currently pending between, so have been sent by QA, sorry, component A, and have not been read by component B. Yeah, well, that, that's a thing you can do. Uh, I have opinions about that, but they're not too relevant here. You can have a limited buffer. So this is where you can say, I, uh, between component A and component B, we can have a maximum of, say, 10 messages that are due to be read by component B. What happens here is the buffer fills up, and then you end up with something that's roughly equivalent to, to type C, where you have no buffer at all. So in this case, which is what I'm going to talk about here, when component A writes component B, component need B needs to, to receive that message, and then component A can continue to, doing what it wants to do. 
This is important because if component B slows down, it's going to take longer for component B to come around and say, OK, I'd like to have a new message now. That means component A is going to spend more time waiting to send the message to component B. So that time that's spent waiting is back pressure. So super simply here at the top, I've got a simple go function, but it should be moderately readable from, by anyone. We are in an infinite loop, reading a message from MySQL, and then we're taking the time writing to component B, which is the writer Chan, i.e. the thing that will publish it off to Kinesis. And then we are observing the time since we started <laughs> writing. And that's being recorded in a metric called delayed back pressure seconds. Um, so in Go, this might be specific to Go slightly, but um, if component B is waiting, if component B is generally faster than component A, we'll find that this actually takes like no time at all because component B has already gone through its cycle and is now waiting for something to be rendered. In that case, I think it's like two locks time, which is like 200 nanoseconds maybe. I don't know. I don't do low level stuff. Um, so this histogram here goes from one millisecond all the way up to one second, which is less than what we talked about previously. So back pressure to me, uh, I would expect the back pressure on this to be basically always zero. And if it hits one second, I would roughly consider that to be as bad as if it were to hit 100 seconds or so on. Anyway, dumping that on a graph is exactly the same as what we saw before. Uh, we're not, again, we're not thinking about this at all. We're just dumping, we, take, we know it's histograms, so we're going to dump the quantiles at the quantile numbers that we've got conventions. Maybe the one interesting thing here is I've used a log axis on the y axis. So you see the distance between 1 millisecond and 10 milliseconds is the same as the distance between 10 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds. Potentially, this makes a slight difference in that. Uh, as you go into larger buckets, the, bu the distance between buckets is larger, obviously. Uh, so what we find there is that each individual point has a lower accuracy. I, this is just like I was thinking to myself yesterday in the hotel room. But by putting it on a log scale, I think the accuracy per pixel of y uh, should be roughly equal. And you don't suffer from weird distortions where values that are high here are completely random. Now, on something actually useful, back pressure is a little bit like if something goes wrong, I might look at it, but it's not actually something I'd alert on immediately, or at least not without thinking. Lag, however, is a, it's my favorite metric by far when it comes to Q-based systems. So we can, lag is very like, everyone knows what lag is. If I, this uh, system is meant to, you say, I want to receive a message now. If you receive a message now plus five seconds, even the least technical user will probably say, OK, it's a bit laggy. And a slightly more technical user can define lag to be five seconds. So um, the way we did lag monitoring here was using a tracer. So we would continually, or at least every 10 seconds, uh, send a message and see how, what the lag on it was. So in my top loop here, I've got four range in basically once every 10 seconds. Send a message which is due now. So because it's due now, the if there is zero lag, it should arrive now at my receiver. And then in the data, I also store the time it's due. And that means when I receive the message, I can look at message.data to get this to see the time it should have arrived. So then in my receiver, I read that message in and I do the time since it should have arrived, which is in message.data, and store that. And dump that as a metric at the bottom as delayed lag seconds. And I can alert on this, and I can graph it, and life is wonderful. There is a slight issue, though, of what happens if the lag monitor here goes down at the same time as my uh, deferred whole big pipeline thing. Well, what will happen is delayed lag seconds will stay at 10, despite the fact that there are no new traces coming through, and the whole thing has kind of gone tits up, and we have, everything's terrible. There is a better way of doing this. So if what if, instead of exporting uh, delayed lag seconds directly, we exported the timestamp when the last message we last received was sent. So by doing this, we can then calculate the, the lag seconds by using the time function of Prometheus, which returns the current Unix timestamp, minus the time when the last message you received was sent. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it ends up it being the same thing for any given instant of which Prometheus was scraped. Sorry, the application was scraped. So we end up with something like this. Um, one fun thing is, if we go back to the line at the bottom here, time minus delayed lag 
delay trace the last received epoch seconds. What's the gradient of this? So the gradient of time is unsurprisingly one second per second. Uh, and then delayed trace the last received epoch seconds will only ever reset. So if we jump here, what we see is lots of little jumping up and down. And that's because this Prometheus I've got here is being scraped, is scraping applications once every 10 seconds. So uh, we scrape, and then over the next 10 seconds, it increases because time is increasing, but the last time we received a message is not. And then we scrape again, and it resets. There are also some big spikes, and that's just from me being a bad programmer and making the application panic. Uh, cool. So the SRE book was mentioned earlier today. Uh, one of the things that uh, Google SRE book talks a little bit about is SLIs and SLOs. So an SLI is a service level indicator. And the way I've always answered this has been that it is a metric that correlates with what you might consider the operational health of the service. So for this service, I could say the average lag in any given uh, time period is my SLI, because I, I want to keep lag low. But to be honest, actually, I consider a lag of more than 60 seconds as broken as a lag of a day. So I define my lag, at my sorry, my SLI as what proportion of the time was lag greater than 60 seconds. And Prometheus makes it moderately easy to track this. So I can just do delay lag seconds as smaller than 60. But what happens if I do smaller than that is I get a filter. That will return me any metrics where the current value of delayed lag seconds is smaller than 60. What I actually want is what I've got here by adding bool after my smaller than sign. This returns a metric where when delayed lag seconds is smaller than 60, the resulting metric is 0. And when it's greater than, it's 1. And then if I want to say see the proportion of time which lag was greater than 60 seconds, I can then take the average in any window here, and it will return me the proportion of time which lag was greater than 60 seconds. So I can dump this on the side here, and I can use Prometheus's average over time function. So this allows me to take that, so I should be clear here, I've defined SLI colon delayed lag colon threshold as an aggregate there, and then I can take the window after 30, over the last 30 days, and take the average over time. So this is the kind of thing where we might calculate the lag on a per cluster level, and then we would federate the SLI colon delayed lag colon threshold metric up to a kind of a longer term Prometheus instance. And this was something we did at Qubit because our actual cluster level things had like 14 days or 15 days worth of retention, and they usually crash more often than that, whereas our long term one, uh, well, it wasn't that great either, but it had longer than that. So I can dump this as a single stat on uh, my graph. I don't think it's super useful to have this as a whole time series, but as a kind of a top level that I might put, uh, like, this is the first thing I want you to see when you come to my dashboard. And if any like wandering PM comes along, they can look at this and say, well, I guess we should prioritize stability over feature development. Uh, hopefully, maybe, one day. Uh, so <laughs> I've also got the lag there, because in the event of an actual incident, you might you find that the lag often burns down. So if you've got a large backlog, you might increase capacity, but your lag doesn't drop to zero immediately. It just gradually decreases. And so it's a nice thing to be able to track, even though when the system's fine, it's completely useless. We can alert on it. There are two things that I care about for alerting when it comes to queues. Uh, message, messages being dropped and lag. I never found a really, really nice, uh, like, well, elegant way of measuring messages being dropped. So I just like sum the errors, which is a terrible, terrible thing to do. Uh, and it's not equivalent at all. But lag is super easy. You just say, hey, my lag is greater than six seconds for five minutes, which means if the thing goes down, then within six minutes or so, because you add up to them, uh, we should fire an alert. Maybe one interesting thing here as well is the dashboard underscore URL annotation. So uh, when Qubit, we wanted to ignore alerts, we sent them to Slack. Uh, and one thing we did was we, if you added a dashboard URL annotation, we'd add a nice little uh, emoji of a, I think it was a clipboard. And if you click that, it'd take you through to your relevant <laughs> dashboard. And when in some cases we had per client alerts, we could actually use templating from other variables to because Grafana allows you to parameterize a dashboard based on a URL. We could have the emoji take you directly through to the relevant dashboard for the client. We also had other things for run books, but I'm not sure anyone ever wrote a run book. Uh, cool. So uh, diagrams. So this is actually my favorite thing in Grafana. Um, there is a diagram plugin. I think it was mentioned earlier at some point. 
Diagrams contextualize all the data in your dashboard. Dashboards are usually opened by people who don't understand them when something has gone wrong, and that's when they need the most help. Dashboards should be documentation. Most dashboards aren't. The diagram plugin sucks. It uh, is horrific to write. It uh, does not look very good. It does weird, weird things, and it's not very good at showing a load of information. But the fact that I love it so much, regardless of all those flaws, kind of speaks to its actual value, just the feature that it provides. So when someone comes to my dashboard, they can immediately see, OK, the MySQL reader, I can see the latencies and the rates up here. And this is actually where it sits in a broader context. So super quickly going through that. Um, it looks a bit like dot. It's not dot. I wish it was dot. Um, you have nodes, you have edges, you have graphs, you have subgraphs. Uh, yeah, be consistent. The only thing I might really mention here is that squares, diamonds, and circles uh, do not use them. Uh, the problem with those is that they, uh, the, the area of those is relevant, is proportional to the square of the amount of information, of the amount of text inside them. So that means if I have a long label like MySQL Reader, I get a very, very big box. And that kind of leads the human brain to believe that that thing is happening a lot, or at least that's what happens for me. I think that a big box means this thing is happening a lot. If I use a rectangle, then it's linear, and my brain doesn't get as confused about how often that's happening. Cool. So I ended up with something that looked like doo -doo -doo, this. Um, and I did this without thinking. So this is the, the aim here, is that as a, as a developer, I can come along on day zero of having Prometheus and implement a dashboard that looks a bit like this. And this is a decent starting point. And someone who sees this probably understands some of the value of Prometheus and decent monitoring at this point. Actually, like nothing I've really said here is Prometheus specific. Um, but like someone who sees this from day one can kind of get the value of decent monitoring. And then they can come along, along later because they've got the kind of the vocabulary now and add in alerts. They can customize this. So I think there are some useless things here. I think MySQL reader back pressure is actually useless. I think MySQL read latency and MySQL read rate are, you only need one of them. And actually, MySQL read rate is always one because I set it up to poll at one per second. Um, so there's some really uh, terrible things here. But this is about as much information as I want on a graph. We can see that the diagram is right down the bottom, just below the fold. I think that's fine. It's ugly, but it will draw your eye, and you'll probably scroll down. But there's actually nothing below that. And I tried very hard not to include information below the fold, because when you're scrolling down on a dashboard, and it's just line after line after line of graphs, you don't actually gain anything from it. It's, it just, I, don't, I can't scroll down on dashboards. It, it breaks me. Uh, <laughs> One potential thing you might add here, I, think I had back at Qubit on my dash, was um, some <coughs> system stats, CPU, memory, and network. They were pure vanity for me. Uh, I was very proud of this, that it ran on 50 meg of RAM, and it was uh, all on one box. Uh, but, and we, but if there ever was an issue with my system stats, I would actually go and click on a dashboard for system stats when we had many of them. One thing I'd love to see in Grafana is a bit more kind of uh, cooperation between graphs. So I would love to be able to hover over my chart and have that highlight some of the other charts. So that when I hovered over my square reader, instantly it would light up the uh, read rate and the read latency. Because that kind of stuff would actually be really cool and useful when it comes to kind of navigating this stuff. But broadly, I was fairly happy with where we ended up. And yeah. That's it. <laughs> Hi, um, you mentioned um, sort of aligning the graphs. There is a there is a shared yeah. Hey. How you doing? <laughs> um, there is a, a, a shared um, crosshair there feature is. in Grafana. So when you scroll over, you can actually see the values on the other graphs as you go along. Yeah, I just love that for diagrams. So I could actually correlate the diagram with the appropriate like columns and so on in the dashboard. Ah, cool. OK. The other thing I was going to suggest is, um, I don't know if you've seen the collapsible, collapsible rows in Grafana. So sometimes if you, have, if you do need to put a lot on a graph, sometimes that's really useful for 
um, hiding some information and they only load as you actually open the rows. So I find that super useful for more l larger dashboards if you if you do have to build those. I've always preferred um, kind of drill down dashboards. So one thing you can do in Grafana is you can have the title be a link to another dashboard. Um, so kind of I find like for say system stats, uh, it's kind of thing where you end up, the organization builds like a very comprehensive per machine stats dashboard and then like have a drill down to that classical rows i always found the grafana user experience a little bit terrible uh sorry anyone from grafana here uh and i find like finding the the expanding very complicated but maybe that's just me 